What's going on, everyone? This is the After the Snow podcast. I'm your co-host, Dave Mays, and I got my partner, co-host, Freeway Rick Ross. What's up, Rick? What up, Dave? What up, y'all? Let's get it. Yeah, man. Back again. Another episode, another week. Some more good conversation for everybody. Uh, Thank you to all of our fans and listeners and viewers who've been sticking with us on this ride. And uh, Staples. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um what's going on? I, I um I like your new background there. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we um testing it out, going to the Essence Awards this uh this month, the end of this month, matter of fact. Uh we're just trying some new stuff, Dave, you know, getting ready to start pushing this twenty one keys to success. You know, the other book been having some pretty good success with it, so uh I'm gonna hit him with the with the 21 keys of success right now, uh, and you know I'm starting to believe them things work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. If you if you put the book out, I mean, yeah, t- yeah. Tell, tell us tell us a little. I mean, the first book um, is pretty much a life story. That's the one that's been out for a few years now, um, yeah. and uh, that's done really well. And it's a really interesting read for anyone who hasn't uh, picked that one up. Um, but well, you tell know, us that's about snowfall, that that was snowfall come from you yeah. know john john was one of the first people to buy the book you know he bought one of the demos so uh mm-hmm. snowfall was born out of out of that that book so uh that's yeah. what I, that's what when I was when, when, when was that like what year did would you say that was 2016 Ooh, we, or? We like seven years six years seven yeah. years yeah yeah. Uh, okay. Matter of fact, it was the same day I got my demos. The same day that we did the uh, the screening here in L.A. You know, uh, uh, at the Magic Johnson Theater, we had the screening there. And uh, what, what was that for your documentary? For the documentary, February Crack in the System. It's mm-hmm. when it debuted. So uh, it's been ooh, close to seven years, man. Six years. You know, I don't keep up with dates that well. Right. But it's right, been like right. six, seven years since a uh, uh, Crack in the System came out. Uh, sold out crowd, you know, unbelievable. And for me, it was, uh, you know, it was my first time to see one of my dreams uh, actually come to fruition. You know, uh, this documentary was something I dreamed about when I was in jail. So to see it actually on the screen uh, uh, was another one of those moments, man, you know, where maybe the 21 keys to success work. <laughs> 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 well, I, I got that same dream. I'm hoping I can make my dream come true and get a get a documentary out about about my life. So, you know, oh I'm man, you're definitely post, definitely supposed to make that happen. Uh, I think that, that that should be an easy sale. But you know, when you're dealing with Hollywood, man, there's never an easy sale. You know, those guys, uh, they some of the most ruthless people I ever seen before. You know, people think that the drug business is ruthless, but those guys, man, they think they're supposed to have everything. You know. And give you nothing that you supposed to be happy. Well, you're supposed to be happy to be famous. <laughs> but see, now what you gotta tell them is man, I'm already famous, so <laughs> right. That ain't right. benefit for me. I'm already famous, you know. Now I need something other than fame, you know. Because that's what so, they're selling. So um tell us a little bit about this this newer book, 21 Keys of Success. What, what what's that about? how'd you come up with that? And what are some of the things that, that you talk about? Well, you know, I, I met a, a guy named Cody Crutcher while I was in jail. He started writing me about my last, maybe last year that I had to do in prison. And, and he had a magazine called Get Money. And he was like, man, I want to put you on the cover of the magazine. And, and at that time, I'd only been on one other cover. I'd been on the cover of As Is magazine. And uh, when he said Get Money magazine, I was like, oh, yeah, that's the cover I need to be on, man, because I'm going to get me some money. You know, so uh, we started talking and, and, and kind of become friends. We started writing back and forth doing prison. And uh, I told him about my three favorite books, you know, Think and Grow Rich, As a Man Think, and The Richest Man in Babylon. And I told him that any person who called themselves an entrepreneur who hadn't read those three books was, was, slipping, was slipping on their pimping. So uh, uh, he read the books and, and we started talking about the books. And when I got out, we did the magazine cover. And uh, I stayed in New York for about a week. We got permission from my PO for me to stay up there for a week. And we went around, you know, pushing the magazine and and just, you know, doing all the stuff that you do, you know, you know, on the magazine. So you already know how that goes. Uh, 
Yeah. So I got ready to leave. He was like, man, I ain't ready. I ain't ready for you to go, man. I want to hang out with you some more. And uh, he said, what if I come out to L.A. and kick it with you? Is that cool? And I was like, you know, I ain't had no friends. You know, uh, I just got out of prison. Did nobody want to hang with me? You know, I was no, broke, no, no. you know, busted, <laughs> disgusted. Uh, but I still could be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> so uh, he came out and, uh, you know, he started going with me everywhere I went. You know, we get up in the morning. And, uh matter of fact, you know, he was the one who uh, uh, they were managing some apartment buildings. And, and it was during the time that we had got kicked out of my mom's house. So so really, technically, you know, Dave, I was homeless for all, hmm. all, all likelihood and purposes. Uh, me and my family, we were homeless. And uh, he allowed us to stay in a, a one bedroom apartment that was in the building that was vacant. Nobody wasn't staying in it. So he allowed me to stay there. So every morning I would get up, you know, he stayed right upstairs. So we would get up and, and get in the car together, you know, and, and we would just ride around and, you know, going to all type of business meetings. You know, I'm meeting with uh, Ori Emanuel, Jeff Bird, Spencer Boomer, Mark Wahlberg, Amari Stoudemire, everybody, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody really knows my situation, you know, because I wasn't. I wasn't broadcasting in and I, and I definitely wasn't really looking for a hand out, you know, more or less a hand up is what I call them. You know, don't give me no hand out. Give me a hand up. And um, Cody had been jotting on these papers every time we go somewhere. He, he I, when we get in the car and I would see him writing notes, writing notes. And uh, one day I just asked him, man, what you doing? Uh, you always jot notes, man. He's like, man, I've been writing down everything that we've been doing. I was like, what? I said, that's a book. <laughs> and that's how the book came alive. And what basically what he had been doing is he had been jotting down me uh, working the principles uh, from those three books as he saw me working them. So the book is kind of generic, you know, wasn't planned, uh, uh, wasn't uh, you know, my, my first book, you know, I sat down and I thought about that, you know, what I wanted to do. And but this book just actually just just popped up, you know. So hmm. um, after he did it, he named it Riding Riding with Rick, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because that's basically what he was doing, just riding around with me. And, and the things that uh, that he saw from riding with me, we put it all in in, in the book, you know. And um, so if, if, if people want to. Um purchase that book, what, what do they do? Uh, we, we got some right now at RickyRoss.com. So they can go there and buy it. The name of the book is 21 Keys to Success by Ricky Ross and Cody Crutcher. Um, I recommend that they check it out while we still got some in stock because they've been, they've been selling, you know, the book has been selling really well uh, when we can keep it. Um, I, I haven't uh, broke down and did a big, a big uh, print like I did with the other, with the first book, but uh I'm in the process of doing that right now so that I can really uh, put it out there for more. What's what's going on with Cody? Uh, Cody is in Columbia now, man. He went over to Columbia and I think he fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we have to get him back over here. But uh, he's, doing well. he's doing well. He calls me about once every other month, you know, and talk about me coming to Columbia and I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how good it looked out to be me in Columbia. You know what I'm saying? When I come back up through customs, they like, I know they come <laughs> all the suitcases. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So uh, that's how it came about. Um, all right. Well, um, before we get into this week's episode, um, I just want to ask you about your, your trip because, you, you know, I'm here in Chicago. Uh, that's the Chicago skyline that uh, folks can see behind me. And um, yeah, I love that yeah. view, man. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Um, but uh, you're going to be here next week. So um, we're going to get to get to kick it. But tell, tell everyone about uh, what you're doing out here. Yeah, yeah. I work with a, with a company called Indica. Uh, you know, we go around the country. We've been going around the country, you know, before the pandemic hit, we were really going hard, uh, going around the country. Because uh, some of the some of the states now, if you want to get marijuana license, they make you uh, uh, clean your record up. You know, even if you had a record, they allow you to go in and, and clean your record up. So what we do over at Indica, me and Bo Money, is, is we get lawyers to come out uh, uh, to the hood, they be in the hood and uh, they expunge people records. They do all the paperwork because, you know, a lot of times in, in our community, 
uh, for, for several reasons. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, people can't read. Sometimes they need glasses. They can't read the fine print. Uh, so what we do is we get lawyers to come out and do all the paperwork for them, file the paperwork, and it pays the filing fees and everything for them so that they can get their record expunged. Uh, we, we've done a few a few hundred uh, people I know uh, expunge their record and, 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 and got them clean, man, to give them a fresh start. You know, we believe that everybody deserves a fresh start. Uh, and, and just cause you was incarcerated don't mean that, uh, you should be stereotyped for the rest of your life as a convicted felon. Yeah. That's a big deal to get your record expunged. Cause you know, sometimes that can be a real impediment, you know, to getting jobs or other opportunities. Um, so what, what is it that you need in order to, qualify to get your record expunged do you have to be like applying for a license for the uh marijuana business or is there other factors oh no oh no we just do it just for just in in gp if if you can you come out you bring your paperwork from your conviction uh um and that's basically all you need your id and 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 the lawyers will do all the rest you know they're gonna do all the filling out the paperwork they're gonna file all the all the papers that you need fill them out for you you know, you just sit there and tell them your information and then they fill it out. And then Indica, Bo Money, is going to pay the fees to uh, uh, to the state. So, so pr- pretty much me. pretty much anyone with a record can get their uh, record expunged if they have the right lawyers and, and know what to do. Is that fair to say? Correct. 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 OK, good. Good Absolutely. to know. And, and probably you probably have to be off the road for a little while, you know. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, because each state is different. I don't know the criteria from every single state, but, you know, you know, I know you'd have to be off parole and off probation uh, uh, before they do that. But uh, pretty much, you know, we've been having some pretty good success in getting people's uh, records expunged. All right. Well, let's let's jump into Snowfall. Um, For those who have been uh, with us, we're we're back in season one. Uh, We're now uh, up to episode eight, um, which is called Baby Teeth. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good episode. It wasn't a lot of excitement really, I guess, till the, till the end. Um, but there's a few things I think that's interesting to talk about. Um, so we remember last week ended with, uh, the fellas on their way home from Oakland, Franklin with the big bag of, of, uh, rock rocks that, uh, he's excited to bring back to LA um, so the first thing, um, you know, we see is them uh, at the crib, chopping it up, ba- bagging up little, I guess, dime bags of, of uh, crack rocks. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It looked like uh, Leon's getting, you know, frustrated with it. Um, but uh, and Franklin reveals to uh, the guys, he said, look, you know, because they thought they were going to go out and start getting money that day. And he said, no, we're going to, we, we need to seed this market. We need to give out samples um, and give this stuff away at first. Um, you know, so. Uh, yeah, that, that caught my attention right off the bat. Cause it, it almost makes it seem as if uh, they started the crack epidemic, you know, right there that nobody in LA knew about crack. Uh, and, and, you know, we still don't really have any timelines, you know, they're not saying that this was 84, 83, 85, uh, but 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 uh, crack had been in what they call crack. We we never called it crack anyway. You know, we always called it free base. Uh, free base had been in L.A. since the seventies. You know, so to say that they went to Oakland and they found a the recipe and and you know they brought it back from from Oakland and Oakland was ahead of Los Angeles. You know that that's debatable, uh, uh, but. I can say that it had already been in L.A. Uh, uh, way before I started. You know, mm. people were doing it. It was it was really secretive. You know, only only a few elite people were doing it. Uh, and in L.A., you didn't need to to to, to see the market. You know, it was already a market here. Uh, you just had to find out and get in the loop with the people that were already doing it. So, so for you, you would say that wasn't really accurate to to what happened with you. It's not like you 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 know started giving out crack in the hood to people in order to to make them you know uh interested in it right it's almost like they turning people in in the crackheads you know they, they they're uh like with me i never introduced anybody to crack 
you know, people, when they came to me, they had already experienced it or they were already uh, thinking about getting into the market to sell it. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like uh, uh, they had on there. Now, I did do a similar situation like that in Cincinnati when I went to Cincinnati. Uh, what I would do is I, I went to a guy's house who's already, he was already a smoker. You know, the person that, I, that, I, that took me there, I, I asked her, can you find me one smoker? And she did. When I went over to his house, I had an ounce of uh, ounce rock of cocaine. And I said, if you can get me 10 people over here that smoke, you can have that rock. So so that's basically how I did it. Uh, the way they were doing it, just out, you know, free giving it to people for free, you know, uh, a little forfetched, I believe, you know, uh, uh, not the way the game was practiced here in L.A. during the 80s. So the, the other thing that happened in that first scene was, you know, Kev wants to try it out and Franklin finally breaks down and says, all right, go ahead and try it out. But, you know, don't don't get caught up with that or, you know, you're going to be off out of here. I'm not going to have you around. So he he tests it out and he st- falls out and he's all, you know, looking crazy. So, <laughs> um, I mean, was that something um, you or anyone else you were working with felt the need to do? Like, we got to know what this is like. Um, you know, before we can sell it. Well, well, you know, when 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 I started, and, and you know, I was a relatively young guy when I started, and the guys who were already doing it was older than I was, was was more experienced, and they warned me from the beginning. Don't, even though they were smoking, you know, like I've had guys, you know, with the pipe in their mouth and and they blazing, and they would say things like, "Young Rick, whatever you do, don't never try this shit." You know, like Cody warned me against it. Um, Like I said, eventually I did try it, but I was so conditioned not to do it that uh, after I tried a couple of times, I was like, no, I ain't never doing it again. Uh, uh, So, yeah, it it was always tempting. You know, my friends and and relatives was always trying to uh, convince me to try it. And eventually they did get me. They did get me to try it. But uh, like I said, um, the older guys had already schooled me to the fact of not getting high that, uh, that, uh, I, I didn't do it. And, you know, one of the other things that I, I and, and without it being a timeline, um, you know, people wasn't using cigarette lighters, you know, cigarette lighters came in like 78, 77, you know, uh, that's more so when people had really got strung out on it. In the beginning, uh, they use 151 rum because it gives them a much cleaner taste. You know, I, I don't really know what the taste was, but uh, um, because when I started smoking it, I smoked it in weed. I didn't smoke it, you know, off the pipe. Hmm. We uh, we thought that and it's crazy. We used to think that it was the pipe that was the that was the deadly thing. You know, we didn't think that the cocaine was the, was was the hooker. We thought it was the, the, the actual pipe. So. Hmm. We sprinkled it in weed. We felt good about that. You know, we, we just smoking primos. We, mm-hmm. we used to call them primos. Um, so we all felt that it was the actual glass pipe that uh, uh, was hooking people, you know, the way you put it on the pipe. So mm-hmm. uh, they had a real particular way, a way that they smoke it, you know, and, and no cigarette lighters didn't come to later on down the line. Mm hmm. So um, one of the next things that Franklin does is um, goes over to see his uncle, Jerome, and his auntie, Louie, and he's uh, showing them the product and explaining, you know, what, what's going on and what his plans are and uh, trying to get them on board. And uh, he tells them, you know, we can make 100000 off a single kilo the way we're breaking this down and, you know, <laughs> we'll be making seven figures a month in no time. And, uh, you know, so Jerome, of course, is a little, you know, skeptical, but, uh, but Louis is like, Hey, you know, it's better for, for, uh, Franklin if we're involved so we can kind of keep an eye on him or whatever. And, uh, Jerome goes along and says, all right, we'll, we'll get down. So I was, <laughs> 
And, and you know what, too? It's, it's, it's crazy because they, they still got stuff so mixed up in this show. You know, like uh, we talking about when he went to Ivy, he was paying 1600 a kilo. And now he's able to sell them for 100000 a kilo. It, the times is, is, is off, you know, on those. Uh, when we were able to make 100000 a kilo or 200000 even a kilo, but we were paying... 48,000 a kilo, you know, to be getting a key for 16 and then you could turn around and make 100,000, you know, those numbers are, are, you know, outrageous numbers, you know, when, when we were, when we were getting kilos for 16, we probably were selling them for like 22, 23, you know, maybe making six or 7,000 or maybe even less at that time, because the lower it went, the less you used to make off a kilo. Like, um, I made my best profit when keys were like 35, 37. I was getting like 12,000 off of a kilo. And then I had a couple guys, you know, that would buy 10 at a time, 15 at a time. So for me, that was, that was, that was really good money at the time. You know, I'd do a deal and make a hundred thousand dollars profit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to say you could take one kilo and make a hundred thousand, it's a little far fetch. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm listening to these guys. These guys don't sound like street dudes. You know, they talk about wall street and, uh, <laughs> I, I heard him in there talking about uh, some Wall Street stuff, and you know, Frank, we didn't know nothing about no Wall Street. We ain't never heard of Wall oh. Street. You know, all we said some, was, I think he said Dow Jones or something like that, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. These guys to be to be out of the hood, you know, to be hood guys, they 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 are really uh, ahead of, of of their time, in, in in my opinion. You know, nobody in South Central was talking about no Wall Street, no Dow Jones, and you know, that stuff, man. We was talking about street races and Church's Chicken and, uh, you know, Who's Low Rider, uh, TNC, Hydraulics. You know, those are the conversations that was popping off in the hood uh, mm-hmm. during those times. Mm-hmm. Um, when you um, when when you were getting going with this, um, how did you kind of select the team that you began to work with? Like, how did you figure who was the right people to put down with you or, you know, did you have people coming to you or how did that go? Well, you know, Dave, I grew up in the hood, you know, so, so, so I know everybody in the hood, you know, this is my neighborhood. This is where I grew up at. You know, we played football together. We played roller derby. We rode bikes. Uh, we started low riding together, you know, um, even though I didn't gang bang, I ran with them with the gangsters you know, uh, so so all of these were my friends who had similar situations. You know, uh, they all needed money. Uh, everybody, everybody wants to be important. You know, there, there's very few people who, who would say, you know, um, I don't want to be important. I don't want anything out of life. I don't want to make nothing out of my life. You know, I, I just want to be a bum. You know, you won't find many people. Uh, with that attitude. So it was very easy to find people that was uh, uh, wanting those things. But now it was a a different situation to find people who were willing to make the sacrifices and uh, the steps, you know, the 21 keys (laughs) (laughs) Uh, to get themselves in in those positions. So basically what what we did is is the guys we knew who is who we started off with first. And um, we would try to uh, teach them, you know, what we knew. It, it's crazy. The other night, I was, uh, I was with little Tommy, and uh, and and he was telling me that that I named him Little Tommy when he was about fourteen years old. Uh, but he was one of the guys that was young, uh, um, and he listened, you know, and he took my steps, what I taught him, and 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 what I was doing, and he took it to another level. Mm, got it. Got it. To where he wow. got, he wound up getting a life sentence in prison as well. But he's is he home now? Or? Yeah, he's home. He's home. Okay. It's funny yeah. how things work, you know. Uh, a, a lot of us, we used to walk the track together, and and uh, we used to all talk about getting out of prison. And uh, after I got out, then they started getting out. You know, I was with Bible a couple weeks ago in 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 uh, in, in Chicago. Yeah. And uh, Bible used to be with us as well. We all been in the library studying, and and uh, 
when, when I was in Chicago, I called him up on the stage and he told the people how when we'd be in the library, I used to always tell him, man, I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of here. And uh, once I got out and he was able to get out, you know, you just when you see somebody else do it, it gives you the 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 motivation and the courage and the confidence that, that it can be done. And, and a lot of times uh, people follow in, in, yeah. in your footsteps. So, yeah. did, I mean, what 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 did that for you? I mean, did, was that just something in you that you were like, you know, I'm just going to get out and figure it out? Or was there other people you well, had you had seen? I, I felt I felt that I shouldn't have been in there, Dave. I mean, if, if you really if somebody really, really digs into my case, uh, I shouldn't have been in prison for that case. You know, I, I wasn't selling drugs. I had no intentions on selling drugs. My intention was to get out. And to get into the rap game, you know, uh, I was sales with Harry O when I was in prison. I, I was right there when they started Death Row. So I saw what happened with Death Row. You know, I knew how they did it. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of connections in the music business as well. So my intention when I got out was to uh, uh, was to go straight and, and, and do the music stuff. You know, I was building a the theater over on Crenshaw and Adams, uh, but I had no intentions on, on doing a drug deal. So when they sent the informant to me to induce me into a drug deal, uh, 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 I, I felt that that was illegal because you, you, you got to look at it at, when, when you're looking at, 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 at dealing with addiction, because selling drugs is addiction too, believe it or not. It's, a, it's, it's probably, in my opinion, it's probably more addictive even than, than the using of the drugs. So here you are fresh out no money uh trying to put your life back together now you got a police informant who the cops have sicked on you and they're offering you drugs you know and and not only are they offering you drugs but they're going down on the price you know when they first hit me it was oh we got them for 1900 i mean 19000 a kilo and when we wind up doing a the deal, they was at 10,000 a kilo. So they were constantly trying to give me a number that would entice me into a, into a drug deal, into agreeing to do a drug deal. Because all, all you need to do is make the agreement. Once you make the agreement, then you're guilty of the crime. Uh, uh, so once I agreed to introduce them to uh, a, a potential buyer, uh, I had already committed a crime. Mm -hmm. So I felt I was innocent. You know, I felt that, that I shouldn't be in jail for that particular crime because it was a made up crime. It was never a crime being committed. And then the DEA comes in and, 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 and creates this crime and, and throws me in it. Uh, um, I, I just didn't feel comfortable with that. I, I, I didn't feel right about it. I was I was mad. Uh, I don't know. It was crazy. You know, yeah. like let me commit a crime and then arrest me. You know, don't make up a crime and then arrest me. Yeah. If that makes sense. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so we'll touch briefly on a couple of the other, you know, the main characters and storylines and what happens with them in this episode. It wasn't that interesting, but, you know, Teddy and uh, his, his buddy Alejandro, um, Alejandro shows up. And tells Teddy that the the base camp down there in the jungle got got hit, and he doesn't know if, if his wife is okay and what's going on. He wants to hurry up and get down there. So that's about it. We see for him. Teddy uh, says he'll try to find out any information he can from his CIA folks, and uh, but he's going to stay in LA because he's busy trying to uh, follow up with this uh, woman who's the. I think the sister of sister. one of the, t yeah, one of the two uh, girls that were were killed by Alejandro when when you know everything happened in that first episode, um, and he's trying to figure out you know what does she know and make sure this doesn't lead to them being exposed. Um, so he spends uh, this episode uh, going to some uh, club where they heard the sister had been. And a waitress eventually comes up to them and says, I, I you know, I know your sister, <laughs> you know. And, I still got the address. Uh, yeah, still happen to have the address written down in her, 
in her uh, notepad uh, order pad there. Um, so I think Teddy, you know, makes a call and has of uh, somebody go over to the house and pretend to be like a lady with with kids living in the house, so that when they get to the house, and uh, the lady comes out and says, you know this is my house. What are you doing here? I only parties that, that happen here are with, you know, my little kids and get the hell out of here to throw her off, off throw the sister off, off the track. Um, yeah. so that's, that's pretty much what we see happen, um, in this episode with, with, uh, with Teddy. I don't know if you saw anything there that you thought was not worth, nothing worth really. talking about. What, what, what really got me was, uh, I, I, I didn't never find out what the, um, uh, the son had told his daddy about um uh uh what's her name and and um the wrestler and his girlfriend remember the son went to the daddy and oh, told him oh pedro we talking about pedro yeah pedro, yeah yes yes we never found out I don't, I don't i was trying to figure out what did pedro tell his daddy right well that's the other you know the other main storyline and the main characters um that i was going to bring up too so that's you know lucia and her first cousin, Pedro, and of course, you know, also who's um, been working with them and got, has gotten involved with Lucia. So if, if we remember last episode, Pedro uh, shows up at the safe house and sees Lucia and also getting it, getting it in. And later he asks her, you know, is she messing with also? And she lies to him and says no. And uh, so I guess what I get from that or got from that is, you know, Pedro uh, at the very end of the last episode, he's like, Dad, I got to tell you something. And um, so, I mean, my my guess is he he told his dad that, look, you know, we're doing this whole side hustle here with the cocaine. We've gotten into the cocaine business, but I'm, you know, I'm worried because I can't trust my cousin. And, you know, I guess. I need you to to help out, and uh, you know that's about as much as as I can see, um, you know, from what what we've seen in, in these last couple episodes. Yeah, yeah, because I, I I was wondering, I was like, man, you think this fool told his daddy that they killed his his two guys? <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I don't, I don't I don't I hope he didn't tell him that. Um, <laughs> and then but, if he did, then the dad was like, okay, oh well, I guess. Uh, I'm gonna get into this cocaine business with you guys anyway, even though, you know, you right. stole from me and you killed my two guys. Right. Uh, I don't know. So I just didn't really like make it clear about it. Kind of left it like kind of out there. What, you know, what Pedro really told his dad. Uh, yeah. But Lucille yeah, was like pretty it. pissed. <laughs> you know, she was pretty pissed that he had went to his dad. Yeah, of course. She was really, really upset. So, yeah, I guess that's, you know, that's what we'll find out probably in the next episode or so is what really happens because they they uh, they show up at the um, at the uh, safe house or whatever. Um, and dad comes in and sees what's going on. And um, we also learn that Lucia's dad, which is Pedro's dad, brother and business partner, uh, is sick. Uh, maybe dying because it, they're making it seem like, you know, he might be dying and he's he's on an IV when Lucia goes to see her. And, you know, he's giving her advice about, you know, make sure you, you, you know, you have people that you can count on and you can't do this all alone. And um, so but. Yeah, we don't we don't know what's gonna happen. I guess I guess we're gonna, we're gonna like find that, out. That, that, that she's going to kick a. Uh, um a uh, big guy out, man. Look like she, also, you know, yeah. Look like also is about to be out of the game, you know, because uh, uh, you know he says, "Oh, so you gonna go with them?" Hmm. M- remember in, in 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 the last scene that they were together, uh, he says something to her about, "Oh, you gonna go with them?" Uh, uh, and gets me, and I think they're gonna quit working with the Mexican gang too, because hmm. they they mentioned that in there as well mm-hmm. while cutting them loose. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you caught that. Yeah, yeah, no, I did. Um, but yeah, I guess yeah, that's that's about all that happened, you know, with this episode. It's just kind of leaving us hanging about what what's going to happen with uh, Pedro and his dad and Lucia and her dad and how they're going to handle this. Um, 
and what happens to Oso. But, um, you know. Because the dad don't seem like he like Oso too much either. Right. Right. I don't know why, I, but he. I don't trust him with one, with one of the two. I don't know, you know. Yeah. I'm about him and Oso, though. Every time he sees Oso, he kind of, you know, he talks to him, but it's kind of like almost like, you know, I'm busting, I'm busting your balls. Right. You know, uh, right. And that's right. just the feeling I get from it, from from the conversations that they be having. Right. Yeah, I don't know if he if he knows or not, if, if the son told him what Oso did, because Oso is the one, I guess, you know, who killed both of his his men. And if he did, he shouldn't have. Any, I mean, also was just following orders. In my in my personal opinion, you know, yeah. also was just like you know, don't kill the messenger. You know, yeah, yeah. So um, the last part of the episode is you know interesting. Um, so I want to talk about that. Um, they've given out the free samples, and um, oh well, you know, Franklin and Leon get into a beef. Um, Franklin shows up and Leon's pissed because he got some blood on his sneakers from the, the fiend that tried to run off with, you know, some of the free samples, uh, the day before. And, uh, you know, Franklin's kind of, you know, brushing it off. Like, you know, Hey man, I've been through all kinds of hell already, you know, to be worrying about that. So definitely Leon had an attitude. They had gotten into a beef um, Leon walks off. They, they call each other names. Leon calls, uh, Franklin bougie and, uh, Franklin said, calls Leon a jailbird as they're fighting. Um, but the next day, um, Franklin shows up at the projects, uh, and Kevin is there. Leon's not there. Um, and, uh, there's a gang of people out there waiting for them and, you know, their eyes light up like, wow, you know, these people are, are here for us already. And Franklin's <laughs> like, yeah, that's what I told you. This is how it was going to go down. And uh, there's lines of people waiting to now start copping these uh, these uh, dime bags of, of, of crack rock. Yeah, that's that's crazy, too. You know, when we start off, you couldn't buy nothing less than $100 worth of cocaine. And if, if you'd have told us in the beginning you could sell $10, you know, we didn't know what ten dollars worth of cocaine looked like. You know, Richard Pryor used to have a joke about that one: ten dollars worth of cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> what did yeah, he say? Was, you remember? No, I you can't remember it exactly. But uh, you know, you can't see ten dollars worth of cocaine. You know, basically, right. like, like right, I'm gonna like, <laughs> a couple of little, you know, little uh, particles, grains. Yeah. Uh, right. yeah. yeah. So they're out there selling ten dollar bags. Uh, at that time, you know, was was unheard of. Yeah. So I guess, you know, we're, we're seeing that this crack rock is highly addictive. People are excited about, you know, coming back, and getting more. Um, so Franklin leaves Kevin and said, hey, man, I'm going to go re-up because we're, you know, we're selling out already. I'm going to go back to the crib and re-up. And, uh, you know, he gets he, he goes home. And um, earlier in the episode, we saw Leon show up at Franklin's house uh, to try to apologize and, uh, you know, make up for him. And, of course, um, uh, what was his name was outside Um, uh, Ray Ray and the other the other guy, um, Lenny. I think it was Lenny. Lenny was outside in the car. You know, he had been stalking them, trying to get his get back for for uh, when they they beat him up and. all that other stuff that happened to him. And uh, so anyway, Franklin gets to the house. He goes inside and as he's uh, getting a glass of water at the sink, he looks out in the backyard and sees a a bunch of mess out there. And uh, of course, Leon is out there bleeding. Uh, He's been shot and uh, Franklin rushes out to him, try to help him, give him his shirt, try to stop the bleeding. Um, And Leon's like, you know, Franklin goes to call the ambulance, call 911. Leon's trying to tell him, like, do something with the crack, get it out of the, out of the crib. Um, and Franklin goes and grabs everything, goes into uh, the next door neighbor's house uh, through the back window to his, his little girlfriend's room and, and stashes everything up in there. And um, that's kind of how how the, uh, the episode ends with Leon, you know, still 
bleeding on the ground and, and they're waiting on the ambulance to, to show up. Um, so, uh, and uh, when Franklin calls the ambulance, he gives the address to the house. He says 1127 West 56th. So I was trying to figure out where that was in LA. Um, it's kind of like between close to the intersection of, of Slauson and Normandy, that area around there. Um, so yeah, just wanted to see if that rang any bells, 56th street or any, anything like well, that. Well, you know, I, I know exactly what it, what it, what a community is. Um, that's that's more uh, where the Brims used to be. It was a blood gang called the Brims. They used to be in that area. Uh, they started in the cocaine game late though around there. You know when when they started, we we had already. So we probably was millionaires already when they got started. So um, nothing really significant about there. You know the Slauson Mall is in that area. You know where where everybody uh, goes and and buy their uh, uh, knockoff clothes and you know knockoff tennis shoes and whatnot. But for the most part, you know, Slauson and Normandy is just, um, just a regular area, nothing special. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's how the episode ends. And, um, before we wrap up, I, I was thinking about this earlier. I wanted to, to bring it up. Um, you know, the, uh, the trial, the murder trial for Nipsey Hussle is going on as, as we speak, it's been going on, uh, this week. Um, uh, and they got this guy, you know, Eric Holder that was charged, uh, with the murder. And, um, you know, so far, mostly what it seems is, you know, they're just trying to establish that there was a premeditated, you know, uh, thing on his part that it wasn't, you know, some kind of spur of the moment, uh, decision to, to, uh, kill Nipsey. But, uh, you know, Nipsey's of course, a icon from South Central, um, Slauson area as well. Um, Slauson and Crenshaw. Yeah. So uh, just wanted to ask you a little bit about Nip, if you ever had a chance to meet him, if you ever went over to the Marathon store. Yeah. So, yeah, just tell, tell me if you, you know, about Nip. Did you ever meet him or me and Nip, store? Me and Nip met a, a, a few times. The first time I met Nip, I was with uh, QD3. Uh, I don't know if you know who QD3 is. That's Quincy Jones the third. Uh, and and we met at a screening for uh, the Little Wayne documentary. I don't know if you remember that documentary that QD three shot with Little Wayne, where mm -hmm. he had Little Wayne taking Little Wayne was taking drugs and and doing all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, they they wind up going through a big lawsuit over it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, me and Nip sat he sat next to each other doing the whole doing the whole screening. So uh, we 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 kind of came acquainted from that day on um we met quite a few times in clubs never did any business together you know tried i tried to do some business with nip you know i wanted to uh but we were never able to uh to do anything uh but we we was cool for the most part you know um you know his neighborhood and my neighborhood don't get along so it, it's it's kind of odd you know even though me and me and big you and 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 all of the, the the guys, you know, a lot of the main guys from his neighborhood, you know, Petey Wack and uh, Big Cat, uh, we we hung out back in the days together uh, in the drug business. Uh, uh, you know, like everybody else, you, you know, I, I didn't have any uh, any bias on who I sold my drugs to, so uh, I, I was really cool with those guys. But uh, me and Nip were always cool. You know, we always uh, shook hands and hugged wherever we saw each other. Uh, took a couple pictures with each other, and uh, as well as uh, at a few clubs together, we took with with with, uh, with other people as well. Uh, but but man, Nip was way cool. I I, I like Nip. Um, he he got a lot of bigger, uh, in my opinion. At the club. Uh, uh, but Nip de definitely was a, a icon here in L.A. Yeah, a big loss, you know, in, for hip hop. Um, you know, were you? Um, were you surprised after he died to see the kind of enormous response to turn out at his funeral and all the other things that happened? I mean, it was it seemed to some some people, I think, overwhelming considering he wasn't as widely known, you know, not a huge superstar at that point. He was big, but he wasn't like a, a superstar. Yeah, I was definitely surprised. You know, I started hearing people play his music. 
that that I didn't even know if they knew Nipsey before 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 the incident. Uh, but he's definitely one of those ones that uh, uh, became bigger during his death, uh, after his death, uh, than he was before. Uh, but I was definitely surprised of, of the magnitude of the people who 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 actually loved him and and his music. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just want to say a couple words about him, and again, why to me it was such a big loss for hip hop because you know he really was one of, if not you know, the only example of a more you know modern day hip hop artist that um, was still really committed to his community and doing things in his community and trying to help and empower the community. Because, you know, generally what we've seen over the years is people blow up and they kind of leave the hood behind. They uh, eventually, you know, either don't or can't come back to the hood. Um, But you don't see a lot of, successful uh, people in hip hop that really um, have tried to do major things for the hood and for, for the community. And, you know, I think Nip was, was rare in that sense. Uh, He, you know, he's someone to me that was heading towards becoming kind of a a modern day, a modern day version of Tupac um, in a lot of ways. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a, a huge, a huge loss, uh, for hip hop to have somebody that, um, you know, was just doing so such important things and that could have been instrumental in helping to lead to greater, greater change. I think that was the path that he was on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it also is, it's another thing that, that, uh, we have to learn, uh, that is certain, uh, rules that we have to go by when you in, in these areas, because, uh, as we know, that guy was uh, from, from the same neighborhood as he was from, they both claim the same set. Uh, and, and so often we see even guys from their own neighborhood kill each other. Yeah. I just, yeah. I mean, to me, that's the narrative that, you know, the powers that be want, wanted to see. They wanted to see, just like with Tupac, you know, everything they did to Tupac's image was to kind of promote that, um, you know, that uh, he was a thug, you know, and he, he got what was coming to him. You know, he's a gang banger and he died a violent death and that's what gang banging or thugging is going to get you. And I think that's the same message that that's being or the narrative that's been created around Nipsey was, you know, he was a gang banger and, you know, this is what comes when you are in that life rather than uh, people really, you know, recognizing that these guys were willing to take the risks of staying in, in, in touch with the community and trying to do things to help create opportunities to get people out of um, these conditions. And so that's, that's one thing that really bothers me about, about the Nipsey, uh, you know, situation that, that, that narrative. Yeah. And it also, uh, uh, helps reinforce why guys shouldn't come to the community once they get their money, you know, it, it, it reinforces, you know, the guys who leave and say that, you know, it's not safe. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, we'll wrap up this week for After the Snow. Uh, thank you guys all. Pardon me. Um, but thank you for uh, staying in tune with us. And uh, we'll be back, of course, next week with another episode. And, uh, you know, appreciate y'all. After the Snow. We out.